you've been following these videos, you know I learned from watching Alexander Waugh's videos that 1740 or 1740 is a number that pertains to Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, and that it's used to encode information in the works of William Shakespeare. In this video, I'm going to show a great example of a 1740 Oxford code that might even convince some skeptics that there are legitimate encoded messages in Shakespeare. A quick reminder, one of the things Waugh explains is how 1740 is part of the name William Shakespeare. The gematria value of the letter V is equal to 20, and a W is comprised of two Vs. So a W, or two Vs, is equivalent to 40. Following the W in William, the remaining number of letters in the name Ilium Shakespeare total 17. So the name William Shakespeare is itself encoded with 1740. In video 48, I figured out how 1740 is encoded into the first folio portrait of William Shakespeare, or rather William Shakespeare. The collar has six pointed lines on the sides and a double line in front that makes an 11. Add the lines on the collar and 6 plus 11 is 17. Next we apply gematria. The collar is in the shape of a letter D, which is equal to the number 4. Beneath the collar are 14 buttons and 14 is equivalent to the letter O. This combination of collar and buttons is equal to 1740 or 1740. The collar and buttons are in the shape of a shovel or spade, and the way it appears to be severing the head of Shakespeare, I wonder if it's a hint at the gravedigger scene in Hamlet and the skull of Yorick, a man of infinite jest. The message being that William Shakespeare, as the face of William Shakespeare, is a joke and prank being played on us. Maybe it's a nod to the skull of Yorick or the head of John the Baptist on a platter, like I mentioned in the video. But all of you know the expression, calling a spade a spade, which has been around since before the folio was published. It means to tell the truth about something, calling it by its right and proper name. The collar and buttons are in the shape of a spade and conceals the number 1740. There are a lot of curious things about the portrait that people have pointed out but this shape and number tell us the truth about the identity of William Shakespeare. Something else I keep finding with 1740 codes is the word king, though I'm not exactly sure what it means. In video 51, I show how the inscription of the 1611 King James Bible has Edward Vere's initials, E.V., connected to a word for king three times, with one of them pointed out by Alan Green. I believe the Rosicrucians and Edward de Vere were involved in the production of the King James Bible, and I go over some of the things I found in other videos. Alright, we're looking at The Tempest, the first play of Shakespeare's first folio and one of the most encoded plays of the text, as it should be, I would think, being the opening play. A lot of people point to the Francis Bacon acrostic on the second page, but I think the first three pages have a lot going on with them, though that's not what this video is about. There are three examples of the word king on the first page, and each is encoded with 1740. Like on line 17, following the words the king and prince, there's an acrostic spelling 4T. And if I continued here, I'd be able to point out three examples of 1740, each around the words the king and prince. One of the lines with the word king might even be hinting at De Vere's name, but I want to keep the runtime down, so let's get to it. If you had one place to look for a code about Oxford, and all you had was the number 1740, where would you look? How about page 17, line 40? From here, by first counting lines, then characters, then lastly words, we're going to find 1740 three times, with one of the codes based on a Greek myth. To understand how it works, in part one of Alexander Waugh's video, Where is Shakespeare Really Buried?, he explains how the letter T, or tau, is in the shape of a cross and the head of an ox. Waugh discovered a message in the sonnet's byline where one of the T's, which is shaped differently than the other, replaces the word ox and then spells the name Oxford. You can see the difference of the shape of the two T's from the sonnet's byline here. Actually, there are more than just a couple T's, and I explain what's going on with them in video 55 and its addendum. Alright, we turned to page 17 of The Tempest and counted to line 40. 
you can see there's an acrostic spelling T for D. Like I just explained, the letter T is a cross, but it's also the shape of the head of an ox. Well, I was able to spell the name Oxford when he used ox to replace the letter T, but a clue was that the shape of the letter T was different than the other. Here there's nothing particularly special about this letter T, and it looks the same as all the others on the page. We're trying to figure out if this T Ford acrostic is hiding the name Oxford. So is there anything that lets us know there's something different about this letter T? There is. This is a method of finding information that I learned from Patrick Jennings, who has a blog and posts videos under the name The Amazing Mystico. Sometimes information that's meant to be read with a code can be found on the same line in the next column, or on the opposite page. Another fellow researcher, Ron Rafael, refers to the method as homostoicos. When you open the folio, page 16 is on the left, 17 is on the right, and this is how everything lines up. Looking closer at this section, when I use the terms acrostic and telestic, I'm referring respectively to the words at the beginning and end of a sentence. If you look across from the T4D acrostic on page 17 at the telestic or last words on page 16, there's fourth, which lines up with T in T4D, followed by magic. What'll happen is, fourth T magic will change the T in T Ford so that the acrostic will spell Oxford. I gave the trick away before I showed it because I want to explain a few things first. I learned about Edward de Vere being the fourth T from Waz videos, and one of the first things I figured out was that the gematria value of the letters spelling the name Oxford equals four T's. T is equal to 19, and 19 times 4 is 76, the same as the letters spelling Oxford. With gematria, there's a bond or sameness between things of equal value, so Oxford and four T's, or four T, are the same, and four T sounds very similar to fourth T. Now check it out. If you look above the T Ford acrostic, there are letters spelling AO and IO. AO are letters for Alpha and Omega, meaning first and last, and is another name for God. In Greek mythology, IO was a princess of Argos and a priestess of Hera, wife of Zeus, the king of gods. To the Greeks, Zeus was considered the one who was and who is and who will be and in the Orphic religion, he's referred to as the first and last. Zeus fell in love with Io, and to protect her from Hera's wrath, transformed her into a heifer or cow. Here's a portrait of her with her bovine horns. Io crossed a strait that became known as the Bosporus, which means ox ford. I know a heifer is a female cow, but broadly speaking, cow and ox both refer to a bovine mammal. Zeus was a thunder and sky god, and how we know that the letters A-O stand for him is, if we look directly across from A-O, highlighted in blue, we get the words winds, vault, as in vault of the sky used in Genesis, thunder, and oak. These words are associated with Zeus as a sky god, and a couple of his symbols were the thunderbolt and oak. I'm not sure about the words across from I-O, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But her name was simply spelled I-O, so that's her. And then we're given the acrostic and telestic combination spelling fourth T magic. So here's what happens. We know that in the story of Zeus and I-O, he transforms her into a cow or ox. And we know that Edward de Vere, or Oxford, was the fourth T. Now just like Zeus transformed I-O into an ox, 4th T magic transforms the T in T4D into Ox4D, spelling Oxford. A little alchemical transformation, if you will, and one of the more interesting typesetting codes I've seen. Now I did wonder if maybe the words across from IO, promontory and up, were to help identify her. A promontory is a high point of land or a rock cliff that projects into a body of water, and there's a well-known promontory circled in red called Sarai Bernu, known in English as Seraglio Point. 
Atop it is the city of Byzantium, which would become known as Constantinople, or today Istanbul, and was found by the grandson of Io. The promontory overlooks an oxhorn-shaped estuary called the Golden Horn, where the Bosporus Strait meets the sea. Is promontory a hint at these ox-themed locations that can be seen from the Seraglio Point promontory? The only other thing I could think of is, a promontory is also part of the body that protrudes or juts outward like a set of horns. In the Aeneid, Virgil describes the shield of Turnus as having an image of Io with her horns raised or uplifted. It's a bit of a stretch, but could promontory end up be referring to Virgil's description of Io's uplifted set of horns? Also, the city of Aeneas said to have stood on a promontory, so I don't know. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments. After this, highlighted in red, is the word command. A command is an authoritative order, so just like you did with Io, could it be Zeus's command that fourth T magic changes the T in T Ford into Ox Ford? The thing is, I don't think it's necessary for every word here to mean something. Winds, vault, thunder, and oak let us know that Zeus is the god being referred to with A-O, and Io's name is spelled properly as I-O, so we know it's her. There's the word required beneath magic, but I don't know if it's saying that to change T into ox, fourth T magic is required. It's also unnecessary because there are enough clues here hinting at Zeus and Io. We know she was changed into a bovine and that she crossed a strait that then became the Bosporus or ox ford. We have everything here to let us know that fourth T magic transforms the T and T ford into ox ford. And there's one more set of letters that I think go with the message here. Printed beneath Oxford's name are the letters AA. I think the two letter A's are a kind of signature referring to the double A's that appear in the Shakespeare headpieces. This is a simple method of encoding involving typesetting. Words in the play didn't have to be changed to fit the code. The printer just had to make sure that a certain section of words lined up with another section. Using the numbers 1740 and acrostics and telestics, the story of Zeus and Io leads to the discovery of the name Oxford, and then it's signed with double A. Like I said at the beginning of the video, 1740 is a number we use to find information or codes about Edward de Vere, and I think it shows design when we find all of that after turning to page 17, line 40. And there's more. We're also told Oxford's a king. Reading the line right above the acrostic and including it, Prospero says, Behold, Sir King Oxford. Returning the letters to how they were before we changed the T to Ox, the line with Prospero's abbreviated name that reads, Behold, Sir King, is 17 characters. And just below this, along the left margin, are four T's remaining in the column. We went from counting lines and finding Behold, Sir King Oxford on page 17, line 40, to counting characters and finding 17 4 T. Now we'll count the words. From the beginning of Prospero in his line, Behold Sir King, the seventeenth word is Prince. And similar to how we found fourth T magic, if you look directly across from Prince on the same line in column two, we get the words for tis, F-O-R-T-I-S, which is another way of spelling four T's written out as four letter T's. So beginning with Prospero and Behold Sir King, Prince is the seventeenth word and directly across from four T's, which can be read as Prince seventeen four T. I think the most obvious place to find a seventeen forty code would be page seventeen line forty, and here in the Tempest, the opening play of Shakespeare's first folio, we find three by counting the lines, characters, and words. Each example of 1740 focused around Prospero saying, Behold Sir King. 
A couple more items on page 17. In column 2, line 17 begins with letters spelling 4T. Maybe that was just done for good measure. And I don't know if this is anything, but directly across from that line 17 4T, in column 1 we get the direction Ariel sings followed by lyrics. Counting the words from the beginning of line 17, the 17th word is cowslips, possibly another hint at the word ox. Then, as now, the scientific name for the flower is Primula veris, Latin for first spring. The cowslip was also called the primrose, which means first rose. Maybe cowslips or first rose, the 17th word of the song beginning on line 17 is an allusion to Edward de Vere as the firstborn. Some believe de Vere was Elizabeth's firstborn son, which would explain all the king codes, but maybe it's some kind of Rosicrucian reference that we don't have figured out yet. There may be more here, but that's what I have for The Tempest, page 17. I think the acrostic and telestic that reflects the story of Zeus magically transforming Io into an ox so that T. Ford becomes Oxford, on page 17, line 40, is not a coincidence or nonsense as some of the findings I have posted have been accused of being. Maybe I was a bit hyperbolic when I entitled the video with the question, The Greatest Oxford Code Ever, and I know there's still going to be skeptics shaking their heads but I think it is a great example of a hidden message in Shakespeare and demonstrates that 1740 and 4th T are references to Oxford. Like I said at the beginning, the Droeschout portrait reveals the truth about the identity of William Shakespeare. A spade is a spade, and can you honestly say that the shape of a spade isn't there and that it doesn't conceal the number 1740? or that the name Oxford doesn't appear on page 17, line 40 of The Tempest. There's a lot going on with the play, and I think there might even be a farewell message to Oxford hiding on the first page from either Francis Bacon or the Rosicrucians, which in terms of codes might be the same thing. I'll post what I found when I can. Thanks to Patrick Jennings, Alexander Waugh, and to you for watching.